Hey guys, it's me, Barely Alec, and boy have I gotten myself into a real pickle this time. The tutorial is the first roadblock of the run. I mean, I think we all know it's impossible normally, so not dashing mid-jump doesn't affect this at all. Even if we somehow get past the first jump, a later section of the tutorial requires shooting, so we're gonna have to minimize our dashes and shots here. To zero, baby! The tutorial is completely optional, so just exit it through the menu and walk out of there. The only issue is that there's a coin at the end, and we're gonna need to collect at least 12 to even be able to damage bosses. Fortunately, the first three are collected by just talking to Mac, which leaves nine, but before attempting the first run and gun, we'll put these three to use. To unlock the worst item in the game, and our only chance of beating this challenge, we need to buy three items from Pork Rind, with the cheapest being charms that usually cost three coins. The only one immediately available to us that will be of any use whatsoever is Bonus Heart, which will give us an extra hit before dying, at the severe cost of reducing all zero of the damage I can do. With it equipped, we're as ready as we can be for Forest Follies. The Deadly Daisies... <laughs> I swear, one of the funniest parts of scripting these videos is just learning the names of random enemies. The Deadly Daisies drop from the sky and run in a straight line, only turning once at a wall or ledge. The ones at the beginning are typically easy to run under or jump over, but the ones past the first log can sometimes give you a really tough pattern to dodge, so just restart if you're hit this early. Right after we find the first coin we'll need to pick up, I recommend playing this level slowly so I just stay on the floating platform to let the deadly daisies run off to make their formations much easier to dodge. Once up the first ledge, the level gets much trickier as we don't have any safe platforms above enemies for a while. Since when we jump, two daisies will fall from the sky. I initially tried playing it safe, but there are daisies that come from the right of the screen as well, so it's more of a matter of learning when they'll come, and run and duck accordingly while also keeping in mind the <laughs> murderous mushrooms that fire spores at Cuphead if he's in range. This is usually easy to dodge since it has such a long cooldown, but the chaos of everything else going on at the same time makes it all the more difficult. We can still parry, thank goodness, to avoid the- oh, uh, I know. Uh, annoying Aggressor. Running Rapscallion. Uh, cheerful Chaser. Bothersome Blueberry. <laughs> Wait, really? Once passed, we can safely land on elevated ground that always avoids everything except the terrible Tulip's pellet shot. To avoid this, I just stand on the right of the platform and run towards the middle once the pellet reaches its apex, since it will land in the direction I was standing initially. A good run will have all 4 health once I reach this spot, though I would continue some attempts with 3 if I was feeling a little… dangerous. I don't jump down until after a daisy falls, since they continuously do on a set timer and I let them run away to give me enough room to maneuver. Things get chaotic again after waiting for safe patterns as there is so much on screen with daisies also turning back at a ledge so this is another common area I got hit at. After collecting another coin, there isn't much else to avoid until there's a pit that we're supposed to dash across as it's too long to jump over. The two ways we can get past this are just to take the damage from falling and getting pushed back up while going right, or baiting a spore cloud into shooting at an angle where we can parry it to make it over. This is much less consistent since even if you line this shot up without taking damage to something else, the spore cloud might not be parryable since I believe it's a 50-50 whether or not the cloud will be pink. So I usually just take the damage to get past this and bring me to the worst part of the stage by far. There's a bothersome blueberry running back and forth, aggravating acorns falling from the sky, three murderous mushrooms shooting the player, and some deadly daisies that eventually disappear, and I honestly don't know why, but that does make this easier. The reason this short area is so bad for us is that we'll be spending a lot of time here. 
and that's due to an acorn maker blocking the path ahead that we can't just run through with invincibility frames. During a regular pacifist ranking of this map, simply parrying one spore cloud then dashing over the machine clears the obstacle. Without dashing, one spore cloud won't cut it, especially with acorns being produced faster than we can get over that damage cuphead and push us in the wrong direction. We'll still need to line up spore clouds to parry off of, but we'll need two instead of one. This makes things so much more complicated for so many reasons. All the enemies are still trying to kill us, so we have to dodge all of them. The mushrooms having a long cooldown just means more dodging. The two that we need to shoot are slightly apart from each other, so they fire at different times, forcing us to wait for everything to align. And last but not least frustrating, the spore clouds only have a 50-ish percent chance to be parryable, so even if we line everything up perfectly, there's a 75% chance it won't work. It is definitely possible with just one spore cloud, but every time I was able to do it with one, I either had to dash, since I was just practicing, which allowed me to get over before an acorn knocked me in the wrong direction, or be at one health so I would die to the damage from touching a machine, which also required a much more precise and admittedly lucky setup. But after many, many, many attempts, I got Cuphead to parry the first spore cloud, got knocked back by an acorn which allowed me to parry the next cloud without the threat of another acorn getting in the way, and I got over. Thankfully, I was able to get to the nearby exit my first time after making it over the machine. None of the coins require you to go that out of your way, so now I have 8 out of the 12 that I need. Oh no, if only I could get to Treetop Terror! This running gun is much simpler to beat under my restrictions. It mostly comes down to there being way fewer enemies on screen at a time, and shooting not helping much in the first section to begin with. The only noteworthy places I took damage from was the stack of wood with three stumps that can be jumped over, but is precise. The jump next to them is also possible, but again, precise. And the four stack of wood that I believe the only way to get past without taking damage is to parry right when the top one shoots, but that's much more complicated than just using iframes. You're required not to get hit by at least one of these obstacles, however, since you need to skip the mid-boss of this level by jumping down the pit and getting pushed back up past it to clear the stage. That's another 5 coins, since, again, none require you to go too out of your way. Now that we have the 12 coins we needed, I buy pea sugar and coffee, since they cost 3 each, which finally unlocks... Whetstone! Yeah, it's not good, but it can deal damage without shooting, special arts, or EX moves, so it's all we've got. And with the worst charm in the game that most people don't even know exists, we can finally get into the run proper. The first boss I fight is the Root Pack, which is the perfect introduction to this challenge as it does a great job teaching us the basics of the run. Whetstone allows us to damage enemies, albeit lightly, by parrying them even though you normally can't. It's important to note that Whetstone only works on the first parry, which means you can only do it once while in the air, and if you parry a pink object, you can't whetstone until resetting it by landing and jumping again. The potato teaches us two valuable lessons. One, the hurt boxes in this game are kinda weird. In particular, it looks like the hurt box for the potato is just a straight line that best aligns with his face. Two, the longer a fight goes on, the more and more likely it is that you'll get hit, even by something stupid and avoidable, so we should be looking for strategies to hit bosses as quickly and consistently as possible. The one I eventually landed on was to start the fight by jumping towards and parrying the boss. Then, for the first 4 slow shots, jump and whetstone in a way to avoid all of them while getting in a hit for each. Before he fires his medium speed shots, I get in 2 free hits, while still not moving cuphead left or right. I do short hops to dodge all of them and for the last worm, whetstone during that jump. 
I get two more hits before using the parry of the last one to move backwards so I can prepare to avoid the fast pattern with short hops and some adjustment to Cuphead's x-axis. Now his pattern resets, so repeat until phase 1 is complete. Once I get good at this, I would reset if I ever took damage during this phase. The onion can actually be skipped by just not attacking him, which will make phase 3 harder by spawning a radish as well. But for your sanity, d don't spawn the radish. Phase 3 is already the hardest one to begin with. We don't need more going on there. Once the onion enters the screen, you can whetstone him multiple times safely, and this extends to the first time he cries, since he only does so briefly. After that, Lesson 3 takes into effect. Attacks that come from the top of the screen really suck. Our only method of attacking bounces Cuphead into the air, made even worse since without dashing, we have to complete the entire arc of the bounce before landing on the ground again. Lessons 1 and 2 are still in play here, so I don't want to wait until Ollie stops crying for a couple of seconds to get a few hits in, especially with how fast the tears are on expert mode. So what I do is try to be smart with the way I angle my whetstone hits. The tears never fall in the same spot twice in a row, so if I see one fall directly next to Ollie, that's when I go in for a whetstone hit, and instead of using the parry to land away from him, I land in the same spot the tear fell so nothing else threatens to hit me for that brief moment. This is a bit precise since you sometimes have to land between a tear and ollie, but it's a lot more consistent this way and easier with practice than having to constantly dodge tears without getting any hits in. A good attempt would have at least 2 health coming out of this phase, though I wouldn't reset at 1. The carrot is by far the hardest phase of the entire fight mostly due to lesson number 4. Any phase that summons creatures or things to fight for them is immediately way tougher. The same reason we don't want a radish in this phase. In this case, Chauncey summons 5 or 6 carrots that telepathically home in on the player. And where do these carrots come from? That's right, the top of the screen! This is extra bad here too, since even though these only require one whetstone parry to disappear, for some reason, I, I couldn't tell you why, but these carrots take some time before actually poofing out of existence, so if you whetstone them from below, you get parried right into their hitbox and take damage. This means I have to wait even longer for the carrots to move to a safe angle to parry them, and keep in mind that sometimes a carrot will be coming from the top of the screen at the arc of my parry, so I try to angle Cuphead away from where the carrots in the background telegraph. This makes his I-beam attack much harder to dodge, since I always want to move around in a way that I can clear carrots, which allows me to get 1, 2, or rarely 3 hits on Chauncey before the cycle repeats. It's worth noting that carrots will get destroyed if they hit the ground, but that usually takes longer than just whetstoning them, so I only do it sometimes if the situation arises. So yeah, phases that summon things that don't leave the screen themselves are going to be very chaotic and claustrophobic. But then it happened. I had 3 health going into Chauncey's phase. With how much practice I've gotten by now, I'm much more comfortable with movement and how to prioritize things in this phase to prevent the boss from completely overwhelming me. But the homing carrots still gave me a tough time. I have to constantly angle my parry arc between two carrots while dodging the beam and clearing just to keep pace with the boss and get in any hits at all. But after 4 minutes and 5 seconds, and enough carrots to feed a small bunny over a long period of time, I finally beat the root pack. If you combined all my practice and attempts, it only took me 2 hours and 45 minutes. The root pack took me 2 hours and 45 minutes. If that's how long it's going to take to beat the root pack, then I mean just, I mean, wish me luck for the other bosses. And you know what, let's just pull this up here. The next boss we'll take on is Goopy Legrand. His first phase was a little tricky at first with his sporadic jumping until I learned to always hit him right after he lands and to always continue holding whichever direction I was going to dodge his attack where he pulls his face back. 
otherwise it would actually hit me during the windup. Knowing this and practicing a bit made this phase an easy one where I'd reset if I took any damage unless I was really close to a second phase. The transition between phases allows for a decent amount of hits, with the top question mark doing a good job of blocking one attack. Once Koopy grows, I only go for 3 more hits maximum since he's about to start moving. The second phase is actually really tricky, since now that Goopy is grander, I can't jump over him and am instead at the mercy of whatever type of jump he feels like doing. Normally, you can just dash to make up for not reacting quickly enough to whatever jump Goopy does, but since we can't do that, there isn't much we can do other than try and react quickly. This makes his fake out jump where he pretends like he's about to jump but then waits a nightmare since you always have to keep in mind he might do that but then it turns out it was a short hop so oh look you got damaged you flippin' fool. He mixes these in with bigger jumps which can also be dangerous if he used to jump off the side of the screen. He also stops to punch randomly so this phase requires a lot of focus. To actually get in damage I almost always attack him from behind once he just jumped over me. You can usually get in 1-2 to two hits depending on which jumps he does before he hits the side of the screen again. If he's near the side of the screen before jumping, I don't go for an attack since a long jump will hit you and trading blow for blow isn't the best idea in this challenge. This is actually really difficult with one wrong move resulting in taking damage, but with enough practice it is possible. That just leaves the last phase, which again can get damaged in advance during the transition. I hope the second phase has prepared your reaction time because this next one is just inhuman. The tombstone only has one attack. It slides back and forth and will slam down on the player after sliding past them about 1-3 to three times, but since you never know when he's gonna do it, there's no consistent way I could find to dodge it while still getting in the damage I need to do in order to actually, you know, win. Even playing it passively by running past him instead of trying to get in whetstone hits also loses to the unpredictable nature of his slam, sometimes being delayed enough for Cuphead to run past, or happen instantly where not turning around right away results in a hit. I tried aiming for a different angle to parry off of the tombstone, but it all boiled down to the same issue of not being able to react in time simply because you're supposed to dash while passing the boss. I was saving this trick for a rainy day since it feels kinda cheap, but I mean, you can see what challenge I'm doing, right? I'm gonna ban the use of glitches, but this doesn't fall under that category. This isn't cheating and is an intended game mechanic. If I'm gonna win, I'll have to take advantage of every little thing the game gives me, so without further ado, I'll pause the game. If you pause right as the tombstone moves partially in front of Cuphead, you can see if it's going for an early slam. If it does this, just turn around and run back to dodge. If not, just keep running past it to safely get to the other side. You can get a hit in right as the tombstone pulls itself up from the ground before it starts moving again. With this simple trick that doctors hate, this phase goes from inhuman to I'm groovin'. The total time it took me to practice and beat this boss was 2 hours and 40 minutes. A lot of it at the end was due to me refusing to use the pause trick until phase 3, but after the fight I realized I'm just not a fan of wishy-washy rules like I can only use the pause trick sometimes, so I end up using it a lot more in the future and made phase 2 harder on myself for no good reason. But if you think about it, that's kind of the entire purpose of my channel. Goopy Legrand, go play with the other kids. But this easy streak is over. We've got three options left on Isle 1. Cagney who summons a bunch of other enemies to deal with, Ribby and Croaks who summon a bunch of other enemies to deal with but also both attack you at the same time, and a flying level. Cagney it is. This boss is when I started streaming this challenge after some practice, and I'm gonna let past me explain what sucks so much about phase 1. All the bosses suck uh, after the first two. But... I mean just not- I'm just not gonna do anything, you guys can just watch. How- like, look at this. So these deal damage, 
uh, if you jump into them, but the vines don't deal damage. But the, these little, these chompy boys, they deal damage. And they deal damage right when they, like, spawn from the, like, vine. Let me just show you what I mean. Like, and it makes them really annoying. Like, boom, here it is. Uh, but what also makes this suck is, uh, the, is the hitboxes. So, Cagney's already got a lot going on. But first, I'll elaborate on the hitbox issues that are present in other bosses, but not nearly to the degree that they are in Cagney's fight. Cagney has three insanely wrong hitboxes that make this already difficult fight just that much harder. The first one you already saw where once Cagney goes back to his idle animation from shooting seeds in the air, which might I add come from the top of the screen. During this transition, for whatever reason, being near the top of the screen in front of Cagney damages you, which sucks because it forces you to wait for him to idle, instead of hitting him if you know he's about to stop shooting. His other weird hitbox isn't necessarily wrong, just kind of inconsistent that it doesn't have a hurtbox in the same area. While Cagney spins his arm during his shooting attack, the arm hurts you, but you can't hurt it, which forces you to dodge it while going for an attack. And keep in mind, it moves back and forth, which sometimes forces you to angle your jump backwards, and then forwards once above it, and then you can parry the flower part of Cagney and angle the jump back to safety. The third insane hitbox, well, I'll save that for when I talk about the third phase. Before that, I'll talk about Cagney's actual attacks. You've seen that he shoots seeds into the air and they fall from the top of the screen. They start from a random spot and stop once one falls in each possible area once. The blue seeds sprout after being planted into the ground and grow vines that rise a random height before sprouting a toothy terror chaser that will choose a random direction to travel while slightly homing in on the player if you're close enough to them. Fortunately, these guys can disappear by hitting the ground or just moving off screen, so you don't have to clear all of them yourself. Pink seeds are parryable, of course, but if you don't or can't, they spawn a toothy terror floater that will travel left and right on the top of the screen, periodically shooting a parryable bullet at the player. They're immune to damage unless they open up to shoot, but since we have to jump at them to hurt them, this commonly results in a bullet being parried instead. Clearing floaters is also a risk while seeds fall from the air, which they do more often than not. While a floater is already on screen, pink seeds that plant during this time will usually turn into regular toothy terrors, though they can rarely turn into a second floater. All phases taking much longer than they normally do when you can, you know, shoot, means it's unfortunately pretty likely to happen during a good attempt, which will usually turn it into a bad one. Why, why, do, why is he, why is he trying to attack? Oh, there's two of them? Oh, uh, no you didn't. Oh, and then, oh, and now we're, now he's, now, now it's even more of a cop. Now, now we're entering super fight. If I had to describe this phase in one word, it would be chaos. There is so much happening on screen, and knowing when to hit the boss and when to focus on dodging or hitting other enemies is key to beating this phase. The strategy that culminated from my substantial amount of attempts was to try to get in 6 hits on Cagney at the start of the fight before he switches back to his idle animation. Although, if I see that a parable seed hasn't spawned yet, and he started shooting from the left, I knew a pink one would fall next to me. Keep in mind that these have floaters in them, so I would always parry them in this situation, which would mean one less hit on Cagney, but a lot less chaos until the next cycle. Now the fight opens up a lot where you're reacting to what Cagney and his summons do. I clear the ones near Cagney that would prevent me from attacking him by getting in my way, and while doing this I either angle my parry to put me between Cagney and where the rightmost seed can fall so I don't get hit by them, or since the seed can only fall in each location once per rotation, I parry towards where a seed already fell to safely land. This trick is most helpful against floaters since the seeds can even damage you off screen. 
Once nearby enemies are cleared, you're safe to damage Cagney until he stops shooting and gets the weird hitbox again, so keep that in mind. You'll sometimes be forced to run away from Cagney in order to dodge, but after the double digit amount of hours I spent in this phase, I got pretty good at dodging between enemies and falling down the platforms while paying attention to the seeds and floaters. So just keep it up until Cagney finally switches to phase 2 after like 24 hits. Phase 2 itself is actually pretty easy. It's the weird limbo between phase 1 and 2 that's the only real threat here. You see, when Cagney switches phases, the summons from phase 1 don't automatically disappear, which can make dodging his phase 2 attacks in conjunction actually difficult. Once again, the floaters are the biggest issue, since oftentimes they open when I can't hit them, and clearing summons takes priority over damaging the boss here. But once they're cleared, this is probably the easiest phase out of any boss so far. To dodge the boomerang and homing acorns, I stand on or below the furthest platform from the boss. If the acorns home in on you while you're on the bottom, just jump up. If you're on top, just fall down. For the boomerang, just duck no matter where you are. The only worry with the boomerang is when it's coming back as Cagney extends his face to attack, so pay attention to when these happen at the same time and you should be fine. After his face attack, I go for two hits, similar to how you can hit him in phase one while he isn't shooting, and get an extra hit if his face went below instead of above the platforms. His hitbox is kind of weird when he switches faces again, so I wait a bit before getting in one hit and retreating to safety. And no, that isn't the third terrible hitbox I was talking about. Uh, this is. And this hitbox being terrible is so much more impactful on the difficulty of this fight than the other ones I mentioned, since it appears whenever he shoots dandelions, which he does very frequently, and he grows 1-2 to two vines that damage you if you're on or above the platform they grow over. That doesn't sound relevant at first until you consider that in order for me to do any damage, I have to dodge both of these attacks and the weird hitbox. This means that I can usually only get in one hit when his dandelion shots just happen before I go for the parry and a vine grew on the closest platform to Cagney at the same time. Otherwise, I risk getting hit by a vine right after dealing damage. There are a couple more situations you can do damage than just that, so I'm always looking for safe opportunities to decrease the amount of time spent on this phase. After going in for a hit, make sure to short hop back to the middle platform so you can dodge whichever way you need to. It helps a lot to parry off the orange petals instead of the face. Without dashing, the vines in general are really dangerous attacks, with no out if I jump to the wrong platform right before the tell for them growing happens, since I can't just dash out of there. So to counter this and take advantage of every situation I can actually get a hit in, I use Postrats here. This greatly increases my odds of surviving, though there are still times when damage is pretty much unavoidable through bad RNG. Be aggressive when I can. Oh. You want to know the great thing about a difficult final phase? Even if it takes around 44 hits like this one? You only have to beat it once, so after 14 hours of practice and attempts, well, you'll see. Let me hit you, that's the rules.
What? No way! <laughs> I thought I was at like 39. Holy crap! What? Oh my god. We did it, boys. We did it, boys. I'd like to thank uh, my family. Uh, the last five, three, six minutes, the last seven minutes, the last eight minutes of my life for the last nine minutes. Well, the last ten minutes is actually what I meant. I like, well, actually, it's, I guess tw 12 minutes. It was thir 13, 14 minutes? 15. 16 minutes 16 minutes and 46 seconds yep i'd like to thank the academy skill level oh a d plus well sometimes it's just that easy uh, i'd like to uh thank also normal and gabe you guys you guys were with me the whole time well not really because the whole time i fought that boss was like 14 hours, but you guys were there at the end for a lot of it. Um, and yeah, I, I've ascended. All right, Cagney, you earned it. And you know what? While well, I'm here, Hildeberg is attractive and is the size of an average human mother. In her blimp faces, she attacks with an automatopoeia of her laugh. Yeah, that's right. I passed fifth grade. During these phases, she also summons zeppelins that shoot at Cuphead's current location. Thankfully, no matter the color, they leave the screen in the same direction they enter, so I don't have to clear them here. The pattern of her summons is two purple, then one green, with only one appearing at a time here. The purple ones only shoot a single bullet, while the green ones shoot five in an arc, making them much more threatening, especially when more things are happening on screen at the same time. Oh, also, I just realized I forgot to mention this in the script, but shrinking in plane levels is banned since it replaces dashing. While seeing footage over what I've been talking about, you might have noticed two things. We're in the sky, and Hildeberg moves in a wavy pattern. While we're flying, Whetstone has slightly changed properties. I couldn't tell you why this is, and it took me a while to get used to, but since the cooldown doesn't refresh once you hit the ground anymore, because again, the sky, the cooldown is time-based, where if you miss and hit nothing, you have a much longer cooldown than if you land the hit. Again, no idea, it's super weird, but super important to know and get used to. As for the moving back and forth thing, that obviously makes hitting her hurt box without touching the hit box much more difficult than doing so with the stationary target. Fortunately, the first phase is very easily cheesed. I don't know if this is true or not, but people have been telling me you're supposed to shoot in this game, but if that was the case, the game would be designed around that and say give bosses attacks that only hit you if you're in front of them, and not above, below, or behind them. If you fly above Hilda and hug the top of the screen, that's right, we're friends now, Hilda's hitbox, onomatopoeia attack, and purple zeppelin bolts can't ever reach the player. The only two things you have to be mildly concerned about are zeppelins appearing on top of the screen to bump into you, and green zeppelin bullets since these can be fired from behind them. To avoid bumping into zeppelins, just pull back after every other hit since the summon pattern is top, bottom, top, bottom. The green ones are easy enough to dodge since you don't have to worry about anything else right now. After 10 hits, she inflates to propel herself off screen. She can do this at very inconvenient spots and get a cheap hit in, so I actually count the hits in this phase, even though I normally don't since I find it to be distracting, but this phase is already really easy, and it usually takes more than double that for most phases. Once she reappears, she'll always turn into Gemini in expert mode. Sorry honey, I don't get along with Geminis, I'm a Cancer. Uh, feel free to laugh at the bad joke. I mean, Hilda thought it was funny. <laughs> this phase sucks, and that's mostly due to her hitbox slash hurtbox both being the same size, but also bigger than they should be given her model. These inaccurate boxes are already bad enough, but combine that with a wavy pattern going left to right, and you've got a phase that's really difficult to consistently hit without getting hit yourself. But, of course, that has nothing to do with her actual attacks, which are both difficult to dodge since they often overlap. 
Again, she summons Zeppelins, the pattern being green-purple-purple on loop. Her other attack is telegraphed by Gemini raising her arms in the air and spawning an orb on a random location near the middle of the left half of the screen, and they will shoot in a line that covers that entire angle of the screen. It's random if it moves clockwise or counterclockwise and is only really a threat if a green zeppelin shoots at the same time. The reasons it's usually not that bad are because you can pause twice to see the direction the bullets are going, and it always starts firing diagonally, so just make sure you're exactly on the left or right of it when it starts shooting. Also, for some reason, the orb doesn't have a hitbox, only the bullets do. So you can make some sharp turns to dodge or immediately attack something after the bullets can no longer hit you in that area. It's a lot more efficient to clear the summons as they appear, not only to prevent their shots, especially the green, but also because of that weird whetstone quirk where the cooldown is really short after hitting something, so you can immediately follow it up by hitting the boss. Keeping this in mind, if I knew a green zeppelin was about to appear, I would intentionally not attack as to not risk missing so I could clear it right before it's shot to prevent its bullets from being on screen at the same time as Gemini's. If I missed or didn't have an opportunity to hit one that spawned at the same time Gemini was about to attack, I would just back off to hopefully dodge the incoming attacks. That just leaves actually hitting the boss, which I could never get down 100% consistently, but as I got more used to her hurt box, I would move up for an attack and as it was hitting, immediately pull backwards so I don't also touch the hit box. It's not perfect, but I could eventually get through this phase with 2 or 3 health pretty consistently as I got better at it. Phase 3 is another blimp phase. The transition from Gemini to this one can leave the bullet orb on screen, which makes it the most likely part to take damage. Aside from that, Hilda now can spin a tornado to launch at the player. This move is the reason we can't just go above Hilda again, since the tornado's hitbox will damage us but it doesn't stop us from going below Hilda. Not only is this angle safe in the tornado's animation where you would think the hitbox would be, the bottom of the tornado actually doesn't have a hitbox while she's spinning it. The bottom right of the screen is a little harder to hit Hilda at since you have to move up a little to hit her and then immediately back down, but the real issue is the green zeppelins, which are the only color that spawns during this phase, and they're now harder to dodge thanks to something no one probably expected to come up, and that is that the foreground blocks my vision of Cuphead. Quick rundown of this is that there is constantly a foreground of trees, and whatever that's called, coming in and out of the screen. Thankfully, them obstructing my vision usually doesn't matter since you can just hold the right and have Cuphead safely dodge most bullets while at the corner of the screen. Any green zeppelins that spawn on the top have one bullet hit that area however, so for them instead of relying on visual cues, I just got used to tapping left to move between the two bullets. And after getting used to that tap to dodge, I never took damage during this phase again aside from the odd transition hit. Which is great because phase 4 is insanely difficult. I was never able to get as consistent as I would like at this phase due to the sheer amount of things happening on screen, coupled with Sagittarius's movement pattern. On the upside, her hurt box actually aligns with her model this time. The downside? Everything else. Sagittarius's one attack is to shoot an arrow in conjunction with three star bits that home in on the player. On expert mode, these home in for longer, which forces us to clear them. Otherwise, they'll still be chasing us while the next wave is as well, so we do have to whetstone them. This phase is the one where I really had to learn how to get good at whetstone's cooldown, which made me a lot better at the second phase by extension. The star bits almost always take priority to clear. You can usually clear all three pretty quickly since they only take one hit each, with me usually staying at the bottom of the screen to clear the lowest one first, then middle, then top. Missing one hit means you have to dodge while you wait for the longer cooldown to refresh, which puts the star bits in a more difficult to attack pattern, as two are usually put on top of each other, so you have to do the same trick with Gemini where you move forward while attacking and immediately pull back. Only these are faster and there's more going on at the same time. 
That's thanks to the zeppelins that now spawn in a pattern of green, purple, purple, and what makes them trickier than they've been so far is that they mostly spawn from bottom to middle to top, back to bottom, and so on. Here, they can change up that pattern sometimes, with the only truly consistent thing being that they won't spawn on the same third of the screen if the previous Zeppelin did. The green ones are much harder to dodge in this phase than any other, since so often they attack at the same time as Sagittarius. For this reason, I always try to focus on hitting them, sometimes breaking from my normal starboard attack pattern to do so. After clearing Starbits and any Zeppelins that spawn on the bottom, I can actually attack the boss. I find Sagittarius' hurt box mostly easy to hit, but with so much going on, it can be difficult with her also swaying constantly and the threat of Zeppelins appearing on the bottom of the screen. I do prefer attacking from the bottom, as you have more room to maneuver, but if the opportunity for an attack from top arises, I go for those too. You can get upwards of 5 hits, usually 4 maximum, before she shoots again. Thankfully, the starbits spawn in front of her, so they won't hit you if you're still attacking her to get maximum damage in. Still, I would usually take 1 or 2 hits this phase due to an exceptionally bad pattern of overlapping attacks, or just moving too close to her hitbox thanks to the constant moving and attacking present in this phase. Seriously, you have to spam whetstone and move around so precisely in this long phase to even get a single hit on Sagittarius, who takes like 34 hits to beat. It doesn't help that this phase is a huge endurance test, with it taking around 8 minutes to get this far, and well, it's not even close to done yet. But keep clearing, 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 and clearing so you can actually hit the boss, and this phase will eventually be over. Now, it doesn't help that this is another time where transitioning between phases leaves previous summons and projectiles on screen. But as soon as the opportunity appears, just like before, fly to the bottom right of the screen. This time, it's actually easier since Hilda summons two zeppelins at once, but the pattern is two purple, then one purple, and one green, so you see a lot less green. The only drawback is the minimum height they can spawn in is lower, so if you know Zeppelins are about to spawn and could come from the bottom, either don't go for the hit, or try to kill it on its way to the left so you can get a hit in when it would normally be moving back off screen. And with another mostly free phase beaten, all that's left is by far the worst one. The transition here is actually beneficial for us, since we can get about 8 hits in on the boss if done correctly, but make sure to back up as soon as she turns into the moon, or you'll get hit. I did look for potential cheese spots, like hitting the red part of the moon, which doesn't work, or moving to the corners of the screen, but she knocks you out of them, so we're gonna have to play fair. Or at least as fair as we know how. Once again, the bottom of the screen is safe, save for the foreground, only this time literally the entire bottom of the screen that Hilda isn't touching is safe. Normally, the stars that move from the right of the screen to the left in a wavy pattern are tough to dodge consistently, especially with how fast they move on expert mode. But again, it's like the game is designed around using some kind of ranged attack or something, because the stars never touch the bottom of the screen. That's not to say the stars aren't a problem here though, since if I ever go for an attack on Hilda while her face extends forward, I need to make sure a star doesn't collide with me as I go for the attack. I don't find pausing to be very helpful here, since there's so much moving on screen that you need to keep track of and Hilda's hurt box is once again kinda weird, where I don't want pausing to ruin the precision of setting up a hit. Her hitbox slash hurtbox is a weird arc that mostly aligns with her face, where I find the best places to hit consistently, are her mouth, where I align the propeller of the plane to be just under the front of her teeth as to not touch her hitbox. Her nose doesn't have a hitbox or hurtbox, but another good place to hit her, should the opportunity arise, is to align the propeller at the indent of her face between her teeth and nose. This is much easier said than done, since going slightly too forward results in you taking damage, 
but slightly to back results in not hitting the boss at all. It's to the point where it's usually not worth trying to precisely move forward if you're slightly off, since you'll probably just move too far ahead and take damage, since you get so little time to set up and attack her before a star hits you. Once the stars align by not aligning, we can go for 0 to 4 hits depending on the situation. To give me more time, I look at where the stars are heading before moving up from the bottom of the screen, and if none are in the way, move up before Hilda's face extends to damage her right away. No matter what, we can't stay for long since the UFOs will spawn while she's in this state. These are incredibly easy to dodge while not worrying about the stars, with red meaning go through them since they shoot soon after first moving under them, and yellow meaning move up but not through since they shoot once right before you move under them. But the stars often are moving in a way where they block us from moving up to the boss. If this happens, just keep calm and wait for the next round of UFOs to finish. So to recap, this phase is extremely difficult due to precise movement and hurt boxes, the stars moving at an incredible speed, and coming from the side of the screen that we're closest to. I don't know, if I can consistently get- like, I've been trying to get good at getting the two hits in, because obviously if I can speed it up that much, that would be the deal. Oh my god! You see that? That one came out of nowhere! And something I haven't mentioned yet, this phase takes the most hits out of any we've seen so far, with roughly 75 hits of wet zone to beat her. If you weren't convinced this fight is an insane endurance test, then you should be now. After practicing safely getting in hits for enough time, and consistently getting through all of Hilda's other phases for a good 21 hours, this happened. Bro, you can't... What?! Yes! Oh, my God. oh, okay, 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 I have a... I have a comeback. I, I thought of it. I spent a long time thinking of this. I'm a wimp, and you're a chimp. Um, a couple of- some people in chat, I think Normal and Gabe were talking, they said I should say, you've heed your last ha? Huh? Um, that's also pretty funny. That's funnier than mine, honestly, but I was like dead set on saying that. <laughs> but how many- guys, what time do you think that took? That was like 30 minutes. No, that was like an hour. That, it felt like an hour. I know it wasn't. I can't believe it because- that last phase, the whole time I had one health. How was that the attempt I won? <laughs> Dude! It's not stopping! Guys, someone stop the timer. It's gonna keep going. Someone stop the timer. Is it gonna be 30? Please be 30 minutes. That would make me laugh. That'd make me smile. <laughs> Dude, what? <laughs> what? I even got a parry, so I get 1 out of 3 for parry, so I probably get an S rank. 35 minutes and 40 seconds! Skill level 3? Alright, game. Okay. Alright! So, yeah. I was pretty happy finally beating Hilda, but I already put her on the tier list, so let's get into the fight with Ribby and Croaks. Uh, I was saving this one for last since it's the hardest one on the aisle. There's only one phase that makes this fight as difficult as it is. Phase 1. On expert mode, Ribby and Croaks attack at the same time. That alone wouldn't be too bad, but Croaks' one and only attack has him spitting 4 to 5 fireflies. These fireflies come out in bursts of 1 to 3 at a time and periodically dash towards Cuphead's current location. 
Unlike Cagney's summons, these don't just disappear and will strongly home in on the player with each dash. The only way to get rid of them without using whetstone is to have them dash into the ground, but that requires way more setup than we can manage, since by then another wave of fireflies will be summoned and we still have to dodge Ruby's fists. You can tell Ribby is about to attack when he puts his foot in the air. Once he slams it down, he rotates his fists in front of him to launch energy fists at the player, which are thankfully always in the exact same pattern of bottom, middle, top, middle, and bottom. This by itself is extremely easy to dodge by jumping, ducking, and jumping again once the last fist is launched at the bottom but doing nothing except dodging this attack will quickly make Croaks' Firefly stack up to the point where they can no longer be avoided. So we're gonna have to clear as many flies as we can while Ribby attacks. Clearing flies directly above you is trickier than it might look. Since the height of a jump is determined by how long you hold down A and use what stone you have to press A in the air, Attacking a fly from below commonly resulted in me either missing the attack or input altogether, or just jumping straight into the firefly's hitbox. I don't have any fancy tricks to get better at this, but you're gonna have to get very good at the timing of letting go of A and immediately pressing it again and changing it depending on the height of the flies if you don't want them to completely overwhelm you. We'll also be attacking them from the side for the same reason. The good news is, unlike the root pack's carrots, a whetstone hit from below will actually kill the firefly before you get damaged by their hitbox during the arc of the parry. While Ruby attacks, you can jump up to clear a firefly and make sure to land ahead of or behind the next fist while ducking or jumping to dodge the one after that. To consistently kill fireflies during this attack, you'll have to keep in mind where they are, where you are, where they'll dash due to your location, and where Ribby's attacks are and will be. I always try to line myself up in ways where I can clear the most flies, but when Croak summons new ones, those can snipe you in the air, so you have to keep that in mind too. Dude, it, like, these stream snipers. I know they're watching. <laughs> Look at that stream sniping! To play around this, you can beta fly lower and angle your parry as much to the side as you can, rather than angling it upwards. You can also kill a fly near the upper left corner of the screen, as flies very rarely get shot in that exact area, and even if they do, if you attack fast enough, they won't reach you in time. Since Croak summons 1-3 to three at a time with a maximum of 5, you can use this knowledge to get in some safe attacks. So if he summons a fly already close enough for you to hit, which is kind of rare, but every little trick adds up here, you can whetstone it right away as you know he has a short cooldown before summoning again. More often, you'll see him summon one or two that is one dash out of jump in whetstone range, but after one dash we'll be in range to whetstone which will require a sideways arc as I mentioned earlier if you don't want to get hit. The worst spot he can summon in is the back of the screen, especially when he summons two or three at the same time there. You get in these situations where they just corner you and you can't clear fast enough because of Ribby's fist blocking you. But even in situations that look like a sure hit, you might be able to look for a solution from a different angle. So to actually beat this phase, you'll constantly be adapting to different situations and since this phase takes so long, unfortunately, it isn't uncommon for Ribby and Croaks to continuously give you patterns where you're forced to clear during three or more waves of their attacks without getting in any actual damage on the bosses themselves. At least, that's what it felt like for the longest time, but as I got better, I found this to be much more unlikely. I should probably mention the me actually attacking them part. The reason I haven't yet is it was actually just that rare to get any damage in without losing. Right when the fight starts, you can whetstone Ribby's body with the leg not having a hurt or hitbox until he lifts it. 
You can get 3 to 4 hits in, and for some reason the fireflies don't seem to have a hitbox right when they're summoned, so you can avoid them by being close enough to Ribby, but it's incredibly precise, so I usually do a low parry to disengage, since Ribby is about to attack. Situations like this are another opportunity to get a hit in. When Ribby spins his arms, you can whetstone off of them. A high parry will result in getting hit by a firefly, but a precise lower angled one can get an extra hit as you back off to focus on clearing fireflies. Later in the fight, when the brothers' attacks are slightly desynced, you might be able to get in a hit or two by jumping above the middle or top fist and parrying the arms before Croak's attacks and then land in front of or behind the remaining fists. Probably the most common attack I eventually got used to was after Ribby stops attacking and Croaks is just about to summon a burst of 1 to 3 flies after I just finished clearing any left on screen. Either attack right before a new burst is summoned, preferably at a low angle, or right after Croaks summons a burst, pause the screen to see if there are any in the way of an attack, and if not go for a hit before backing off to clear. It's important that if you go for this, immediately start clearing again, since having 4 or 5 fireflies on screen while Ribby attacks again will basically guarantee you get damaged. That's it as far as situations you can safely get any damage in on the boss, and as for what I have to say about this phase. I just got really good at clearing the flies and getting in damage whenever possible until eventually I started to see phase 2 once in a while. Now, like I said, phase 1 is the only truly difficult part of this fight that makes it so bad. But phases 2 and 3 aren't completely free. Okay, phase 2 is kinda free. Granted, not as easy as Cagney's second phase, but for this, just run towards Croaks no matter if he's in his normal form or has turned into a fan. The fan pushes you back, and I thought without dashing, that would make this phase much harder. But the fist moves are incredibly easy to dodge, since they always follow the same pattern again. This time it's bottom, middle, top, so just jump over the first one, duck under the next one, and run to the right of the screen so you don't get damaged by the spinning arms. For the ball things, just keep as close to croaks as you can, and don't be afraid to jump over them if necessary, but otherwise stick to the ground. If you find yourself close enough to Ribby and are in a situation where predicting the wrong type of angle would damage you, just pause and if he angles it upwards, you might have to run towards him. In that case, immediately run away from him again to prepare for future projectiles. I recommend only damaging Croaks since he literally just stands still if he isn't a fan, and you can even hit him while he is a fan for some extra damage. His hurtbox and hitbox seem to be roughly the same in both forms, at least for his upper body, but always focus on dodging if Ribby is or is about to attack. After an easy phase 2, the transition to 3 allows for about 3 hits on Croaks and 1 on Ribby before an attempt gets to die to a literal slot machine. Okay, phase 3 isn't that bad. I expected it to be much worse since we can only get in 1 hit before having to dodge since the slot machine is invincible when not attacking. After dodging coins by jumping up and down in place and parrying the lever to roll those bones, we can get in at least one hit no matter which of the three attacks we land on. To line up for the hit, I always jump towards the machine and parry off of it even though it can't be damaged yet so I know I'm close enough to get in the actual hit. The visual cue I use for the actual hit is that the animals glow from left to right three times before the attack goes out, which makes machine vulnerable. Right before the final animal glows, jump and as it does, parry off of the machine to damage and angle yourself away from a potential attack. It's actually a lot easier than it looks, honestly. As for the three possible attacks, the one we want to see is the snakes. This attack will continuously summon platforms we need to jump on with spikes on the side so missing means taking damage. But since these are just platforms, we can parry the boss an extra 3 times before it becomes too fast to keep up, and then I just recommend jumping between two platforms at a time since jumping between each one will likely have you fall. It's also worth noting that when I see this will be the attack, I back up from the machine to more safely angle my jump. 
both the Tigers and Bulls are pretty much equally bad in my opinion. For the Tigers, after getting one slot machine hidden, just focus entirely on jumping between the spiky platforms that now shoot balls up and down. The real threat here is not being able to dash at the end as I would normally. You have to perfectly run between two very close platforms, adjusting your turn and jump a decently precise amount. For the bulls, after getting in your hit, back off so you can jump either below or above fire depending on where it will shoot from. The problem with this phase is that they spawn so fast during the middle and end of it, so to consistently dodge, I pause. I keep up these strategies for just a little longer, until this finally happened. Oh my god. No. Oh my god. Okay, so there's a reason I got hit on the fire move twice. And that is because sometimes when you press A to resume the game, uh, like if you accidentally hold it for just like a little bit too long, you do a jump. And that's why you don't want to see this move. <laughs> So close. It's not even funny any. <laughs> oh boy. Cuphead does tax evasion. Okay, so the bulls were actually my least preferred for a while, but to fix the issue of holding down A for too long after I'm pausing, I would unpause with start if I was on the ground but if I was in the air between two fire bars that are shooting down, I'd press A to on pause so I'd be ready to immediately jump when I needed to. I also want to mention that there is a glitch where if you pause at the right frame while one of their three animal attacks is ending, apparently the game doesn't reapply their invincibility until after their next animal attack ends. I always personally prefer to keep my challenges glitchless, and I am doing the same here with this one exception where if I accidentally trigger this glitch because I am playing the game normally. Well, I mean, I'm not going out of my way to do the glitch, rather it's happening naturally, so I'm not going to reset an entire attempt due to this. If it happens, I get in some extra hits while the slots are spinning, since again, if I was going out of my way to get this to occur, I could hit it while it's shooting coins instead of resetting the invincibility after the next attack. But for some reason, my monkey brain, after seeing the boss take damage, immediately jumped for another hit, so I got in 5 extra hits thanks to this glitch, so sorry if that cheapens this for you, but believe me, I'm more upset about this. Uh, but anyway, here's the real victory. 
Maybe. Did I miss that on purpose? It's a knockout, baby! It's a one-hit KO! What was the comeback? Um... Uh... Sorry... But you're a tad bull... Um... Looks like... Looks like I had the last laugh, you comedian frogs. Um... <laughs> I hate bulls. Um let's go. Yes. <laughs> Subscribe. <laughs> Thanks. Otto was here. 14 that was a little bit of a short one, guys. I mean only 14 minutes and 39 seconds this time. Honestly, you guys wanna see me do it again, honestly. The frogs would be worse than Hilda if any phase other than the first one was more difficult. But since Hilda's fight is so much more of an endurance test, and I feel like I could have easily spent 5 more hours on it, I personally think she's the hardest boss in the aisle for this challenge. Even though I spent probably around 23 hours on the frogs, which is about 2 hours longer than I spent on Hilda. During this video, we've been through a lot throughout this aisle, and before moving forward, I think it's important to take time to reflect. I'm done with frogs. Dude, if I ever see a frog again, too soon. Same with stars, remember? The things I can't look at anymore. Flowers, uh, stars, and frogs. And that might extend to toads, but I'm not sure yet. But seriously, thank you so much for watching, especially if you somehow made it this far. As this video goes out, I have not yet started Isle 2 and will have a community post where anyone who wants to can vote for the next boss I take on out of the three initially available there. If you don't want to miss out on these streams, consider whetstoning that subscribe button and I painted the like button pink so you can just parry that way already down there. I'm not convinced hitting the bell actually helps, but uh, you could hit that too I guess. I don't know.